So our, our first session today is Prison Education and the Humanities. It features Nikhil Singh from New York University, Garrett Felber, currently of the University of Mississippi, and Daniel Karpowitz, and is chaired by Francois Furstenberg, my colleague in the Hopkins History Department. Please. <laughs> Well, good morning to uh, everybody. Thank you, first of all, to, uh, to Nathan. Thank you to Bill. Thank you for, to all the organizers. I know um, how much work goes into a conference like this, although I uh, have never organized a conference of quite this level of, of sophistication with all these programs and all the beautiful um, swag that's come along with it. So, um, so I can only imagine um, what did go into this. I'm, I'm particularly honored to be um, kicking off this conference and to be introducing this panel of, um, of scholars, three politically engaged and uh, socially engaged scholars who take their work outside the ivory tower and, and deep into the carceral state, connecting, um, as I see it, you know, one of this country's major institutions to another. They've, uh, they've agreed to keep their comments um, relatively brief on the order of 12 to, to 15 minutes to ensure that we have time for conversation among the panelists, um, and especially, I hope, uh, with the audience. So let me just introduce them uh, quickly, and, um, and we can get this started. Nikhil Pal Singh is an associate professor of social and cultural analysis at, and history at New York University and founding faculty director of the NYU Prison Exchange, uh, Prison, pardon me, Education Program. A historian of race, empire, and culture in the 20th century United States, Singh is the author of the award-winning Black is a Country, Race and the Unfinished Struggle for Democracy, published uh, with Harvard University Press in 2004. This year, he published Race and America's Long War, uh, which locates this country's post-9-11 politics in a long history of racism and imperialism uh, in the United States. Garrett Felber is an assistant professor of history at the University of Mississippi, uh, although, are you at Mississippi yet? Is it? No, I'm at okay, right I think I understood that right. So, so he's actually before even beginning at the University of Mississippi has a series of fellowships at Harvard University's Charles Warren Center for uh, Studies in American History and the New York Public Library's Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, where he'll be comp completing not one but two manuscripts: one on the Nation of Islam, Black Nationalism and Prison Organizing in the Post-War Black Freedom Movement, and the second an edited collection of writings by former political prisoner Martin Sastre. I hope I pronounced that correctly. We're all political prisoners, the writings of Martin Gonzalez Sastre. In 2016, uh, Professor Felber founded Liberation Literacy, an organization dedicated to building social justice literacy and reimagining community through education, conversation, and political action inside and outside of prisons in Portland, Oregon. Our final panelist today is Daniel uh, Karpowitz, who's a director of policy and academics for the uh, very well-known Bard Prison Initiative and a lecturer in law and humanities at Bard College. Karpowitz has served as a faculty member, director, and leader of the Bard Prison Initiative since 2001, where he's overseen curricular and academic design. Karpowitz was the co-founder of the Consortium for the Liberal Arts in Prison, an organization dedicated to supporting college and prison programs throughout the country. He also works as a higher education and criminal justice policy consultant. Karpowitz has spoken and written extensively on criminal justice, um, uh, including his, his really wonderful book, College in Prison, Reading in an Age of Mass Incarceration. He's been a, a Soros Justice Fellow at the Open Society Institute, a fellow at the National Endowment for Humanities, and a Fulbright Fellow in Nepal. So with that, um, we'll just get right into our panelists, and I'm, I'm really excited about this first panel. Let me just get, get this up and see how that looks. Um, okay. Um, good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, I, so um, thank you, Francois, for that introduction. And um, uh, thank you, Nathan, for for inviting me to um, come and talk about 
some of what we've learned over the last few years in setting up the NYU prison education program. Nathan and Shani were at NYU uh, when we were starting, so uh, so Nathan saw some of the the early kind of bumps in the road. And uh, I haven't talked about this program publicly uh, very much because um, we've been too busy doing it, and um, and also because. I don't know. I mean, my, my you know, my, I'm a scholar and a researcher, and you know, and I, I think of myself sometimes as engaging in in more public-facing intellectual discussion. So that's what I'm used to doing. But this has been a, a, a sort of a different kind of, of work, um, and uh, so I'm I'm going to stumble a little bit as I try to talk about it. And I I I have a slide presentation that I'm going to. I think I can make it just run right. Um, Without having to do anything, is that possible? I'm I'm not used to this. my my staff put this together for me, um, and uh, I actually have a staff now, um, and uh, I'll I'll mention them by name. Um, our our administrative director, who's worked with with you at Michigan, I know, uh, is Rachel Hudak, who we hired uh, a couple of years ago, and she's been uh, amazing. And we also have a. Uh, a reentry coordinator, Lauren Broussard, uh, and uh, uh, a communications director, Rachel Bosch. So we now have a staff of three. It's taken us this long to get to get up to that point, um, and they're they're really amazing, and they they obviously do most of the work. So um, I'm, I'm a little reluctant some, somehow to, to 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 sort of be the the person talking about this program in some ways because it's been such an incredible collective effort. Uh, it's um, and, and we've learned uh, a lot uh, doing it, uh, both about what it means to do prison education, but also what it means to kind of try to rethink what the university can be. And, and so I want to sort of talk about both sides of the, that. Um, and um, I'll, I'll try to just kind of flick through these slides while um, while I'm talking, and they don't exactly match up with what I'm saying, but we're all used to listening and like distracted viewing now, so I think you'll be able to do both. And the, the purpose of the slides really is to, they, they kind of come off of our website and they talk a little bit about our mission and values, but they also show some visuals of what the program actually looks like inside. So I'm gonna talk about three things. I'm gonna talk about the strategy and vision behind this program. I'm gonna talk about our curriculum a little bit. And then I'm going to talk about um, what we what we think of as the community network. So so we we talk we call ourselves a college program and community network. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what what is meant by the community network. So we really started this program at NYU. It was a faculty driven initiative um, from across the university. It started really with conversations among people who just wanted to start doing some teaching in prison. Uh, we met with 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 people like Max Kenner from Bard and other people who had set up prison education programs. We didn't really know what we were doing, um, and lo and behold, uh, we got some some leverage with one of our deans, and we got a startup grant from the Ford Foundation to start our own program. Um, and the the vision that we began to articulate in writing the grant, the first grant, um, was that the urban research university especially has the tools to engage in a productive way in solving large-scale social problems. And in this case, we thought that the large-scale social problem that we were interested in solving, or at least addressing, is to think about what contribution we can make to the eventuality of a post-mass incarceration society. So the post-mass incarceration part is important because one of the, the ideas we had in the beginning was that we wanted to do a, a we wanted to teach inside, we wanted to do college in prison, but we also wanted to create pathways from prison to college for our students. Um, and also, not just for our students, but for the, uh, the, the family members, the, the communities, the friends, the, the kind of, the kind of uh, social networks in which our students were coming out of 
that were taking them into prison. So we saw teaching inside as a route to intervening not only in the problem of mass incarceration at its at its at, at a sort of the main point of its of its its sort of horror, um, uh, but also kind of thinking about how it could lead us back to the neighborhoods, to the places where people grew up, to the, the zones where people were basically slated for incarceration even before, you know, they reached puberty in a sense, right? So so trying to think about how we could how we could think of this as a as a circuit and how we could we could imagine ourselves intervening um, in some way in the way in which we designed our program. So the the one of the great things that we were able to get NYU to agree to um, was to offer uh, an NYU degree. So we 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 actually offer an associate's degree in liberal studies at the prison um, for students who can complete the the the, the courses we offer. We teach about 15 courses a year. They're all taught by NYU faculty, mostly tenure and tenure track faculty. That was one of the decisions I made as faculty director at the very beginning, was to try to get a lot of buy-in from faculty who had some, some, some traction, some clout in the parts of the university where they worked, um, to get them into the prison. To, um, to get them committed to the program. Um, there's a temptation because of cost and because this is how universities now work to rely on adjunct teaching, um, to rely on graduate students to a, to a lot of teaching. Um, we certainly have adjuncts and graduate students who now teach in the program, but we've had um, really, really prominent NYU faculty agree to, to go into the prison and teach. Um, and that's been a, a really huge source of um, strength in the in building strength in the program not the least of which because faculty who have some some clout can can ne negotiate with their department sometimes for for a course release or for uh, uh, to allow the teaching in the prison to meet their teaching requirements uh, which is which is obviously huge for them because it's it's a huge time commitment um, but it also you know obviously contributes resources to the program um, we're all we're we're completely grant funded. Uh, NYU doesn't really give us any money, so that's kind of one of the ways we get um, we get sort of in kind support. We we have other kinds of in kind support in the sense that we we squat in the Department of Social and Cultural Analysis, where I'm a faculty member. We've sort of slowly colonized the hallway of offices, so we we have three offices and. Um, you know, so so there's been that kind of that kind of growth. It's sort of organic. It's opportunistic. Um, it's about learning, I think, how to leverage the the capa the underutilized capacities and resources of the university, um, which I think I I, I I I would say you know it's ended up being a, a kind of a hidden skill that I didn't really know that I had. Um, in kind of learning how to do that, but but I would say also that it's not just sort of me. It, it's the, I think there are tremendous underutilized, uh, underleveraged capacities in universities for this kind of work. You know, when I end up going to departments and talking to people, they're um, they're so excited to do something. You know, I mean, we all know you know how how jaded we get teaching in universities and how jaded we get about the university and how so many people go into uh, this work with a desire to, to make some kind of change happen um, or with, with I, the, I, the idea of connecting their ideas to some kind of social change in the world. And, and I think this uh, has ended up being something that um, has, has really inspired a lot of uh, voluntary work above and beyond what um, what what people you know normally kind of do in their day-to-day -day jobs and it's not just faculty it's staff it's people in the admissions office it's people in the registrar's office it's all the different parts of the university we've had to engage in order to basically build a program from from the bottom up um, and again it has been very much a kind of bottom-up effort so um, you know, in terms of our um, in terms of our curriculum, we um, we we as I said, we we offer a liberal studies associates of arts degree. We we kind of s inhabited an existing moribund program that was already on the books at NY NYU, but wasn't actually offering a degree and just kind of took it over for our own purposes. 
Um, it's a liberal arts core. Um, and when I think of the liberal arts, you know, we, 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 we're talking about the humanities and in incarceration today, but I would want to emphasize the, the social sciences and humanities together um, as the sort of framework. You know, I think we're all under the same kind of pressure. We're all under the same kind of attack. Um, and I think in a, in a certain way, um, really thinking more clearly about um, not seeing a, a line of division between the humanities and social sciences right now is, 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 in, our, is in our interests, in our very strong interests. Um, and we've had a lot of, a lot of uh, support from both faculty in the humanities and the social sciences. But the other innovation of the program, I would say, is, is that we've, we've tried to draw pretty extensively on NYU's professional schools. Um, to give students in the prison an introduction to various kinds of professional areas. So we have like an introduction to social work course, for example. We have an introduction to education course. We have an introduction to um, business ethics, um, uh, negotiation, leadership. Um, so those are electives, but they draw on the faculty from different parts of the university, sometimes parts of the university that actually have more resources, especially the business school. Um, so I've been interested in, in sort of making those connections and, and drawing some of those faculty members into the, the leadership of the program, but while keeping this kind of core in the humanities and social sciences. So in a, in a certain way, I think this has really impressed NYU's um, provost and dean because there are not a lot of initiatives that really effectively uh, make this kind of cross-university collaboration work. I mean, there, there are obviously cross-university research initiatives, but, you know, faculty in the law school, the business school, social work, um, education, humanities, rarely are in the same room together, you know, unless it's some kind of dull Senate meeting. They're, 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 they're rarely thinking together about how to do work together, and I think that we have actually um, produced that. Um, the other thing is, is that um, we... We, we really prioritize student involvement and student learning, um, student-centered learning. So we have, um, we have a student council at the prison um, that, that now is actually very much involved in, um, in recruiting new students, in, uh, in, in thinking about program policy, in talking to us about the kinds of courses they're interested in having us offer. Uh, we are at a medium security prison. So most of our students have um, about five to seven years on their sentences, and it's usually the last prison they're going to be in in New York State. And many of them have been upstate for longer. Um, how am I doing for time? Five more minutes? OK. Less, OK. Um, so, so um, you know, and so we, we got placed in that prison by the Department of Corrections. But we also got placed in that prison, I think, because of the way we framed our program and our proposal, which was that we wanted to work with students uh, on the outside. About 70% of our students parole to New York City. We have 50 students that have been released since we started the program. And we're in touch with 45 of them. Um, they come to our office. We have, we, we have, as I said, a dedicated staff person who works with them. You know, we call it a reentry coordinator, but we try not to use the language of reentry. We really try to use the language of student services. So, so what we're what we're doing with our students when they get out is obviously helping with with referrals. Sometimes, you know, getting them from a, a bad shelter to a better shelter. Sometimes helping to pay for OSHA training, um, resumes, cover letters, um, job placement, things like that. But the main the main thing that we're trying to do with our students who get out is to create pathways for continuing education. So that includes um, college on the outside for some. We have eight students who are enrolled in BA programs now, including two at NYU who are finishing their BAs um, now. Um, and we got some scholarship support from the dean to, to, to fund those students. Um, but we also have writing groups. We have theater groups. We have. Um, we have discussion groups, we have meetings. So this is sort of part of, oh, and we also have a, a documentary film project that we've been working on um, where we've been following three of our students um, for a year co coming out, sort of for the whole year and kind of filming them. And then it, it, it in, it, at intervals having screenings with family members and, and, and other students and community members to kind of discuss the, the process. So 
the documentary film has been an interesting project for bringing people together um, and connecting people. And, and so we've been documenting everything that we're doing. And this is sort of the organic part of building up the community network. And it's part of the advantage of being in New York City that we have so many students coming back to New York City. And we also, we also are still in a city where there's a, there is some infrastructure of social services that we can, we can draw upon. And we have this amazing sort of fund that a private donor gave us, which I highly recommend if you can get something like this, um, uh, for emergency assistance for our students. So, so we, we pay off parking tickets. We help students to get their driver's licenses restored. We pay off sometimes student loans. Sometimes we can pay a month's rent or, or a month in the YMCA or you know something that, that sort of, when there's an emergency, we can help our students very directly with cash. Um, and it's really not a lot of money, but it makes a huge, huge difference, especially when someone's trying to get a job where they need to drive, but they have $1,800 of parking tickets, half of which they got while they were in prison. Um, you know, we, can, we, can, we, we negotiate down those fines. So since we have staff, we can also contact the DMV and sort of say, well, we'll, we'll pay this, but you know, can you can you write down this 1800 to 800? It takes about, you know, 15 minutes. Um, but for somebody coming out of prison with that kind of debt, and most people coming out of prison have, have, have debt, um, it, it's really, really been helpful. So um, I think I probably need to, need to stop. Um, we did have our first graduation uh, this, this fall. We had five students get the associate's degree, which was an amazing event. Um, that's the gym in the prison where we have most of our events. We have end of semester events in the fall, spring, and summer uh, that are completely student, student uh, organized. Uh, we have a pretty good relationship with the, 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 the superintendent at this particular prison. I could go into a lot of detail about navigating the Department of Corrections in New York State. Um, and you know, that's, we have three classrooms. That's kind of what they look like. Uh, we have a library we're building up. Um, this sort of just gives you a little bit of a sense of what it kind of looks like inside. Um, and that's our, that's, this, is, these, this is a photograph from our, our graduation. So it was, a, it was a really great moment for our program. And, uh, you know, we, we have, uh, as I said, we're, we're completely grant funded, Ford Foundation, Mellon Foundation, and we recently got a, a big grant from the District Attorney of New York, who's put um, some of the asset forfeiture money from the settlement with the big banks into prison education, uh, which is which is a great thing. It's a drop in the bucket. Most of that money is going to police, uh, but but it's something. And so, you know, it's 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 a it's a good landscape in New York State to work in. I mean, I think not the least of which because of the Bard Prison Initiative, which has been so so successful and really paved the way. So we're going to hear from Daniel. Uh, in a in a moment, um, and so I think we we've ridden the coattails of a lot of people before us. But I also think we're doing some some new things in this space, um, and I hope that um, we can start to kind of set some some example for other research universities, particularly in urban spaces, um, to think about how they can they can do this kind of work um, where they are and, and open up the university to. To a, to a kind of a broader vision of, of access and justice. So thank you. So thank you so much um, to the planning committee and to Nathan for um, having me here today. And um, this is something, prison education is something that I've been thinking a lot about over the last year um, since starting this program that I'm going to talk about, Liberation Literacy. Um, I'm working at Harvard to try and start something there during my year there. And then in my future home in Mississippi, there's a prison to college pipeline. So I'm sort of straddling a future program, a past program, and trying to start one now. Um, 
so those two books that I'm supposedly writing, I spend most of my time thinking about prison education. Um, and I kind of see my remarks um, today mostly as questions and causing problems um, more than solutions. So I hope that we can collectively come up with solutions, but, but I see my role up here mostly as kind of troubling um, some of the things that I struggle with in thinking about um, prison education um, as a practice. So sort of the three um, questions that I have, really the main question that I'm coming at this uh, talk today is, is what is the role of prison education in prison abolition? Um, and, and I'll table the prison abolition question if people want to talk about it later, but that's, that's where I'm coming at this from and that's um, what I'm committed to. Um, and can prison um, education, in fact, be abolitionist? I don't, I don't come at it from a sort of intrinsic view that if you have a prison education because of your proximal location to the prison, you're doing abolition work. I think it's quite the opposite. Um, in fact, I was actually asking um, my contact at DOC to send me an updated photo of the Freedom Library that we started. And she said, oh yeah, the director of prisons in Oregon came in and she loves your program. And maybe this is cynical of me, but my immediate response was like, oh shit, what did we do wrong? <laughs> um, so I think we do have to be really self-conscious about doing prison education as abolitionist work because in some ways we're building things into the edifice and the scaffolding of, of prisons. Um, so a second question that stems from that then is what is the relationship between the university and the prison in creating and reinforcing structures of hierarchy and oppression? Um, I think both, of the, both the prison and the university are places that are fundamentally run on exclusion and um, again, yeah, I realize I'm sounding really cynical up here, but um, <laughs> I think if we're being real with it. Um, so what is the relationship to, w between those two things and how can that actually think, help us think more productively about a sort of prison abolitionist pedagogy. Um, and lastly, um, since the theme of this conference is the humanities, uh, there's a discourse and a trope of um, humanization that runs really through writing about incarceration and also prison education programs. Um, sort of this insistence that prisoners are humans and therefore we should um, treat them as such or that the prison dehumanizes people. And of course, all of that's true. But um, I'm, I'm really interested in troubling the way that, um, that humanization and that language can actually reinforce a sort of liberal um, humanist version that uh, impedes prison abolition. So I'm really, I'm gonna try and move quickly through um, the context for my thinking through these, which is the formation of liberation literacy and what it stands as today. Um, but I think it will help ground some of the more theoretical things I'm talking through. So I was a graduate, this is gonna be very much in contrast to what Nikhil just said about the, uh, the program at NYU. Um, not only is my PowerPoint running on manual transmission, but I also, we probably run the, ran this program for a year on under $1,000. Um, I was dissertating in Portland, Oregon while a student at Univers uh, University of Michigan. Um, so I had no credits, I had no students to bring inside. Um, so it's, it's rather low budget by comparison. Um, so we started, I essentially taught black history courses at a minimum security in Portland for two years um, before some of my students taking part in inside out classes said, you know, can you bring some students in? We really like talking to people outside the prison. And I said, well, I don't have any students, um, but I proposed to the prison that I bring in community members. And they said, that's fine, um, much to my surprise. So um, in about, we just celebrated our one year anniversary. So a year ago, we started bringing inside folks. Um, we crafted this mission statement, um, which is a little opaque, so I'll kind of parse it out, but it's to build social justice literacy in prisons in order to reimagine and rearticulate the relationship between incarceration, our community, and ourselves. And really, to break that down, I mean, I think literacy in the most basic sense is usually used to refer to reading and writing, but we were trying to think broadly about what would it mean to be literate in liberation or in social justice, and what does it mean to have a language and pathway to talk about that. Um, the idea of community is at the center of this work. Um, we, you, there's often a, a discourse or language of um, justifying prison education programs through these are people who will re-enter to your community. And we really pushed against that by saying, look, this, these are people who are part of our community and we want to permeate that boundary and, and really use it to reimagine what community even means. Um, and lastly, the sort of relationship between our incarceration and ourselves. Um, 
in other words, how does how does building a social justice literacy remake um, incarcerated people's sense of their place in history as um, makers of history rather than subjects of it? Hence the Grace Lee Boggs mantra and Grace's work is largely informative of a lot of things we do. Um, just to give you a sense of growth, this is um, by next spring. I'm cherry picking a little bit here. This was a this was a movie night, so we have more people on movie night, but. Um, that's something we do as well. So every month we'll have a documentary film or a, you know, a film on social justice or racial justice, and people from outside and inside can invite one guest, and it's kind of used as a recruitment tool and a way to enter the classroom on, with lower stakes because we're typically discussing you know, a historical monograph or a theoretical work, and it's kind of hard to enter. And, and this way, if you're watching a film, everybody has the same text to analyze. Um, Really quickly, uh, just to give you a sense of the types of books um, and authors that we brought in. So this is just a smattering, um, but these are all authors that we either Skyped or came in person. So you see Dan was nice enough to come down and talk to our group. Elizabeth Hinton, Walida Imarisha, um, all three of them came to the group to talk about their books. And then um, Stephen, Ibram, and Khalil all Skyped in. Um, and part of that was just kind of giving, again, a sense of a wider community of struggle, that this is not just a conversation we're having locally in the prison or in Portland, but that there's this whole wider network of people who are committed to, to this project. Um, one of the things I ran into early on was that if you're reading a book, we were essentially reading a book every two weeks. I was kind of running it like a grad seminar, and I had to back off and switch that to one monograph a month. Um, but if you're moving through books that quickly with 15 people and you have to provide those books, um, that's a lot of books in the course of a year. So we started a Freedom Library. So this is me on the left um, with the start of the Freedom Library, which was just those books that were donated by Robin Kelly and Dan and some other people. I just said, could you send your book? Um, we were really fortunate to have these students at Cal and Gable, which is this elite private school in Portland that has assemblies like every month on mass incarceration. Um, I went there and said, like, oh, should I talk about the origins of mass incarceration? And they were like, oh, no, we talk about that all the time. We just want to know about your program. So I was like, OK. Um, so they did this book drive and really um, allowed us to have a much more robust freedom library. Um, so this is what it looks like now. And this is kind of just a sampling of the types of books that we have in there. It's mostly um, leaning towards racial justice topics, but there's social justice writ large um, is very much a part of it. Um, oh, that's not it. And then kind of, um, I think, a high water mark for us was right before I left in July, we published our first newsletter. Um, so this was through a partnership with a nonprofit in, in Portland called the Independent Publishing Resource Center. So they did all the design and the printing for us um, pretty much at cost. There's an, I mean, this is, an, again, the benefit of being in an urban space. There was an anarchist printer who gave us a discount. So not every town has an anarchist printer. Um, but... Essentially, um, we produced all the content. You can see the masthead was designed by one of the students in our class to give you a sense of kind of the topics. So one, this is a review of um, Christina Heatherton and Jordan Camp's book, Policing the Planet. Um, one of the students was tracing, you know, the three-fifths rule through contemporary um, felony disenfranchisement, um, the prison divestment ca campaign that in Lasse won in Portland recently, um, a, a kind of discussion of Emanuel Wallerstein's quote, uncertainty there is in uncertainty, there is hope. Um, so this is something that we're hoping to publish quarterly, um, and and for us was a major step. Um, and then some just kind of current things that have happened since I left or as I was leaving. One is because it's a minimum security, a lot of folks get out. Um, almost all the people who were in October when I started the program are now out. Um, and they wanted that continuity to stay involved. So now we have an outside reading group that's led by formerly incarcerated people. And the Catlin Gable students also have started a student chapter. So they read the same books as the guys inside, and then they correspond. Because if you're under 18, you can't actually go inside. Um, so they write back and forth about posing questions and responding to those. Um, OK, so moving to um, some of the problems, I think, of prison education to think about. So a couple of years ago at the Warren Center, there was this conference, um, the Scope of Slavery, actually coincided with the American Studies Conference, just like this one does. And it was really um, challenging, I think, to think about the continuities between slavery and mass incarceration, just as today we're thinking about incarceration and the humanities. And part of what I wanted to pose is not really to think about the continuity between um, slavery and incarceration, but writings about slavery and writings about incarceration. So to think about that discourse. 
Um, and largely here I'm drawing on Walter Johnson's work on um, the role of dehumanization and agency in kind of discursive um, framings of slavery. So for those who aren't familiar with Walter Johnson's argument, um, I'm just going to kind of break it down in a couple of major points. So he writes, it is commonplace to say that slavery dehumanized enslaved people, but to do so is misleading, harmful, and worth resisting. And I think we could easily swap out slavery and enslaved for prisons and incarcerated and see that that also holds true. It is commonplace to say that prisons dehumanize people, and it is certainly true, but I also think it's worth resisting in some ways. Um, in part, and this is his larger point, is to say that incarceration and slavery both depend upon humanity. Um, the, the sort of levers that they press use people's humanity. Um, so to, ca to call it dehumanizing obfuscates the ways in which this is a central mechanism. Um, so to just give some concrete examples to anyone who's um, been incarcerated or worked in carceral settings, um, people's time being used against them, the privileges of visitation, even prison education as a sort of right is used against people. So you can only participate in this program if you're doing certain types of behaviors. Um, Anyone who is engaged in these prison regimes knows that the sort of capriciousness of the rules is one of the, the central levers of power. Um, for one prison guard, hugging an incarcerated person is a PREA violation. Um, for another, a scarf is a strang strangling device. Um, there's always the prison officer who's obsessed with brassiers and is going around monitoring you know, who's wearing brassiers or not. Um, so there's all these ways, very human ways, in which... Um, the prisons keep unimprisoned people out as well as inflicting power through this sort of arbitrary human uh, mechanism. So this is really just kind of the grammatical point that Johnson's making. The second is to say that when you say people have been dehumanized, it's presumptuous in the sense that you have actually found a point in which someone has lost a sense of humanity. And, and to, to assign that to someone is really deeply presumptuous. Um, and then lastly, the idea that incarceration dehumanizes prisoners suggests that people have to keep proving their humanity over and over. And this is something that we really struggled with in the group because um, the incarcerated men in my program would talk about the dehumanizing nature of prisons and wanting people outside to see them as human, but they also fully understood the trappings of that argument in the sense that then the end goal just becomes to say, I am human, and that we want a political project that, that envisions something beyond that. Um, so really quickly, I just want to acknowledge that there are other forms of dehumanization that I think are really productive. One is Ferrari's notion um, that there's both humanization and dehumanization, but that only one is people's vocation. And then kind of following on that, the Bogsian idea that the project is really to make a more human human um, in the sense that we're capitalizing on the ways in which humans are creative, um, self-conscious, political and social, that sort of thing. Um, and I don't think necessarily Johnson... Um, is unaware of these, but I think these are ways that we can mobilize that discourse productively. So lastly, I want to talk about the university and the prison. Um, we talk about prison to college pipelines or education for post-incarcerated students, um, but are frequently reminded, I think especially in programs like Inside Out, we see the ways in which um, the university is really for one set of students fundamentally and not for another. Um, and an inside-out program often um, brings this to the fore because we see how incarcerated students are sort of used to teach non-incarcerated students. And we, I, this is a discourse that also runs through inclusion, diversity, and equity programs, is how important it is to have students of color on campus so white people can learn. Um, and I think we see that same thing fun running through, um, through programs that have integrated classrooms. So when we place this on top of a framework where... Um, there's this violence of gentrification accelerated by universities who are claiming imminent domain and profit profiting from investments in prisons. Um, we can see the university as not merely complicit, but actually complementary to the prison. And that that's really important to consider when we're talking about bringing the university to a prison space. Um, I think Columbia University, which is where I did my master's, um, is a great place to kind of explore this, but it's certainly um, representative, not necessarily an outlier. Um, so this is the Justice Mapping Center's map, which, of course, collaborated with the Columbia Spatial Information Design Lab to produce this map. Um, but you can see here that 44 people from a single block on East 120th Street, not far from Columbia, are incarcerated. And these are called million-dollar blocks in the sense that it takes a million dollars a year to support the incarceration for that one block. Um, 
So you can see the arrow pointing to Columbia and then all of the higher rates of incarceration surrounding it. Um, and then, of course, this is the same university that then hosts the Beyond the Bars and has the Center for Justice and recently um, finally disinvested from prisons. So I think we just have to challenge ourselves to work through routinely this inconsistency that the same university that we continually understand is the epitome and distillation of corporate neoliberal multiculturalism and its failings and uh, to deliver anything resembling justice for poor, for poor people and people of color can't simply be held out as the solution for people coming out of the sharpest blades of that machinery. Um, so I do want to suggest some solutions and wrap up here. So the first is maybe thinking of ourselves as prison organizers, not prison educators. Um, I think you can't simply expect to translate the pedagogy of the neoliberal university into a prison space and expect it to be abolitionist. You have to think of yourself as an organi or organizer. Um, Stemming from that, thinking of these not as classrooms, but as study groups. And here I find Robin Kelly's formulation really useful. And he says that the formal classroom was never a space for deep critique precisely because it was not a place of love. Um, and he talks about love and study and struggle as being sort of the centerpieces of revolutionary movements. And I think that that has to be the centerpa centerpiece of prison education too. Um, third, socialist writing rather than capitalist. And here I'm drawing on uh, Vijay Prashad's recent piece. Um, and I'll just wrap up with this. So he, he rightfully points out that it's a, a myth that style is a bourgeois concern, but I think it's also no myth that we should all be concerned with bourgeois style. Um, he describes capitalist writing as liberal and mainstream and producing commodities. And what he says is that it, it sees the event or the meeting or the protest, but it doesn't have a sense of the process or the history. Um, and sort of in opposition to that, the socialist writer um, communicates a sense of of struggle, a community of struggle. Um, so I'm probably not going to have time to talk about the problem of this, so I'll move on, but you can see it in the title. Um, and I just want to say, um, without holding up liberation literacy as in some ways like having figured this out, um, I do hope that this sort of demonstrates, if nothing else, a, a confident community of struggle that's in a process of liberation rather than sort of a fixed event or um, simply students funneling into um, the neoliberal university. Um, and then my last point was going to be about seeing them as uh, incarcerated people as political agents and not simply as students. So I'll be happy to talk about that a little bit more. Thanks. Hi there. Um, so this is about as difficult a speaking challenge as I think I've had in the last year um, because of the breadth and complexity of how this gathering has been framed. Um, and I think uh, that's an opportunity that I will try to engage in uh, by uh, keeping my words as short as possible despite the complexity and diversity of the kinds of topics that have been put on the table by my colleagues on the panel. So um, I guess I'll begin by thanking uh, Bill and everyone else at the Humanities Center for uh, and Nathan for having really made the humanities uh, the framework for this conversation. That's a um, uh, I think that is novel and, 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 and a gift, uh, rather uh, than the other framings that are typically encountered mostly from my line of work from criminal justice and criminal justice reform and those uh, narrower categories. I think this is very important both for thinking about the breadth and depth of how the university can be active in this field and for other ways of thinking about what is so uh, uh, monstrously wrong uh, with both uh, the prison site and the, the way we in the academy do or do not relation, relate to it. So I do, I do thank that for that. And um, I wish my words could um, uh, live up to Nathan's introduction. Uh, they won't. Um, but I will be uh, thinking about cornbread for a long time. And in sitting there nervously trying to think about how to engage that extraordinary um, you know, narrative or, or piece of literature that we were, that was shared with us at the outset, 
um, I was remembering something that I'd tried to write in the past about um, Hume, uh, who uh, are, tells us that justice begins in scarcity, <clears throat> which I think to this philosopher of the early modern and liberal political tradition, right, made, it made, made sense at that time and certainly makes it perhaps even more common sense to us, right? Justice begins in scarcity. That must mean that justice means the sharing out of scarce resources, the distribution of scarce resources. And that's what we're supposed to, this, in this worldview, we're told, when you begin to think about justice, start with scarcity. I think we've lost. I think it's very compelling. I think it's very powerful common sense, and I think it's completely wrong. And not only is it wrong, it's a deeply ideological and politically problematic statement and worldview uh, to which it gives rise. Justice does not begin in scarcity. I'd like to suggest justice begins in luxury and the democratization of luxury. And that's what I think about when I think about the cornbread. Um, so, um, okay, uh, can I just be told the time that, you know, tw 10 minutes or so? I'm going to try to really stick to it so we can really break this out into a, a public conversation. I'm going to try to do a lot. Brevity is not my strength, so I usually compensate for that by being too loud and too fast. <laughs> so um, uh, bear with me. Okay, so a few minutes of uh, just a description of, of my home uh, at Bard College and the Bard Prison Initiative. Bard College is a small liberal arts college in the Hudson River Valley, about two hours north of New York City. Uh, it uh, began with, uh, in 2001, after the collapse of structural uh, Pell-funded redistributive uh, access to college and prison around the country, in which, for example, in New York, Nearly every prison in New York had college, at least one college or university functioning within it. That system was uh, crushed by the 1994-1995 omnibus crime bill. Lots to talk about that if we want to later today. We have some experts and the historians of that uh, political shifts and the policies that followed it here with us. Uh, in, the, in the collapse that followed, right, um, uh, uh, Bard, uh, I won't go through the whole story, but uh, led by a group of undergraduates who had come up from the city, by and large, to study at Bard, started uh, a student project inside the college uh, that culminated in its first step of, you could say, having 15 students who were at Eastern Maximum Security Prison enroll in a year-long course. I was fortunate enough to teach my first class in that program in that semester. It was called American History One which was helpful for the administrators at the college and at the prison, speaking to those parallel uh, landscapes we have to navigate, it was the Constitution and slavery was the really topic of the course. Uh, that was 15 years in one, and that was in the humanities. That was for a vehicle that we had at the college for teaching from the humanities. Uh, to 15 or 16 years later, there are about 325 men and women currently incarcerated across six different state prisons in New York. Uh, studying full-time with Bard College. Those are satellite campuses that Bard College has built. And again, that's a campus with 2,000 undergraduates, 325 additional students, men and women, full-time. They're all matriculated. They're all studying full-time. They're all earning full-time credits, both for AA and bachelor's degrees from Bard College. Uh, there is no tuition, no debt. Um, and up until very recently, as the Danny money, the district attorney's money was referred to, uh, been no public funding for that. And Bard has next to a very a poor uh, endowment. So um, uh, no faculty work volunteer. All are paid. The core of the faculty who are tenured and uh, at Bard uh, teach on overload, and they're compensated with a stipend. Um, the uh, curriculum uh, begins with the premise <clears throat> that uh, the prison is not the place to begin with thinking about curriculum. And nor are people in prison, uh, a divisive point of view, which we may return to and has been touched on in the sort of diversity of programs we've talked about already this morning. Uh, you know, I'll just pause there. For me, um, this kind of work is not uh, primarily about the prison, and it's certainly not primarily about people in prison. Uh, to the degree that's about the prison, it is, and I say this in a you know, consciously provocative way, to the degree that it's 
about the prison. It's clearly not about changing people in prison. It speaks as I think a sentiment all of us here who have spoken this morning share. It's about doing some modicum of intervention to change the landscape of the prison. We'll have a discussion later, I think, about the problem with the rehabilitative model. Nowhere is that more perhaps uh, onerous and problematic than in a college uh, presence inside a prison, where that's the standard justification, of course, the Emilet Marl's view, the idea that um, the college will humanize or uh, rehabilitate, perhaps even worse, uh, the students. As I do this in my work at other universities and colleges around the country, there is no college or university in this country worth a damn that cares one whit about the recidivism of its alumni. That speaks to why I think I'm pleased to be at a humanities forum to discuss this issue. Uh, uh, these courses are in, uh, they reflect the breadth and depth and talent of Bard College and its faculty with no presumptions about the particular relevance to, and I have to put this down, this population or their capacity or their interests, none whatsoever. We replicate the breadth, depth, and quality, and shortcomings, and limitations, and pedagogical conservativeness, if you will, of Bard College, because that's our job. Uh, if we want to change the pedagogies at our universities and colleges, I believe that should happen in our universities and our colleges, and not at our satellite locations inside prisons. I feel very strongly about that, and we could talk more about that. It's too often to find faculty who are told by their deans that they cannot do something pedagogically or structurally on campus and then go into their prison program to do it. Rubs me the wrong way. Um, <clears throat> uh, politics, political theory, anthropology, sociology, mathematics, German studies, Mandarin languages, um, the full breadth and depth of uh, the studio uh, of the liberal arts. Uh, 103 distinct classes in the STEM, that's biology, mathematics, uh, sociomedical sciences, epidemiology, quantitative and qualitative methodologies. Uh, this is uh, the full breadth of a great undergraduate learning institution and with partnerships, um, and I will be delightful to jump, delighted to jump on the anti-Columbia bandwagon uh, when we turn to that and to the relationship between uh, um, urban segregation and mass incarceration and university political economy. Happy to do that. Uh, we do have a thriving partnership with the Mailman School of, uh, uh, of Public Health at Columbia so that in addition to the associate's degree and the bachelor's degree from Bard College, people who complete their college degrees with Bard while incarcerated and have time left to release uh, can pursue three different areas of career training. They are in computer science, they are in uh, gardening and urban agriculture, and first and foremost in public health. So we have a seven course sequence from, taught by graduate faculty at Mailman from Columbia, uh, teaching uh, seven courses in graduate work in public health. Post-release, we are alumni, there are about now five to 500, somewhat more than 500 alumni of this program who are out and about. Um, thriving, and they're thriving in all areas of life. They have gone on, most notably, to 35 different colleges and universities in the Northeast, from Brooklyn College to Yale Divinity. Uh, we had our second graduate in epidemiology from Mailman itself. Um, my first student in 2001 in that class on the Constitution and slavery from the founding to 1860 uh, ended up doing his undergraduate thesis with Bard, I'll turn to that in a minute, in medical anthropology. His topic as a research field was, he began, his, his question was in medical anthro, declining infant mortality in the South Bronx and rising rates of neonative intensive care admission, which he had experienced in his family. So what's going on with that? We're driving down infant mortality and ride driving up to almost the same amount NICU admission. That's a medical anthropologist's nightmare and dream project. Massive capital investment, no increase in health, right? He did that in medical anthro. It was an extraordinary undergraduate thesis. Had three years left prior to getting to, before getting out of prison, where he had been for eight, where he was going to be for eighteen years, and turned to calculus, and finished the calc sequence with us at one, two, and three. During which time he also began to steer the college back to PACE. PACE is a prisoner-created, prisoner-organized HIV, AIDS, and awareness education network that was founded by incarcerated people in New York decades ago, which is a place a lot of people apply to Bard from, right? 
<coughs> pace was. And so a, a number of our students will apply to the college from having been active and activists and self-educators and peer educators in this AIDS, HIV, uh, in-prison educational uh, institution. A great example, I would think, of a homegrown, uh, let's say, liberation literacy example, perhaps. Uh, he went back and started to bend that reach from the college and its graduates inside, where maybe 15% of that prison is a full-time barred student body, uh, to turn us to epidemiology and public health as a potential career pathway for people, right? So bringing together the interest in public health, community health, socio-medical questions that was already there for non-college involved intellectual and activists people inside the prison and linking that up with the college graduated community in the prison and now building out that relationship. So at his encouragement and others, we started to invite mailman faculty in and that has led both to this seven course postgraduate pre-release career track. Uh, and to of 85% of, of our graduates are employed post-release, a quarter of them in the health fields with our second epidemiologist. So uh, this young man who I'm referring to was in that first class with us and helped build the college inside since 2001. Uh, I was walking into a prison in Indiana to help the Notre Dame project that we've been partnering with for six or seven years build their program and got a text from him in the parking lot of the prison. Finally cleared the last hurdle at human resources in New York. He's a senior epidemiologist working for the city of New York's Department of Health in its uh, access and inequality unit. It's sort of their elite research and activist unit inside the New York City Department of Health. So three cheers for uh, freshman seminars in American history and slavery and constitutionalism for medical anthro uh, and Ann Arbor, by the way, the whole staff, uh, half of the staff of BPI at Bard is anthro faculty from trained in Ann Arbor. It's a story there I'll, I'll get to later. Uh, and to, um, and to identifying, rejecting the, uh, one of the things, many things I think we reject in this work collectively is the, right, we've had some references to this. Um, I think our work uh, and this work generally should really push us to question a few things. Number one, the meaning and definitions of elite and democratic in American higher education. What do those terms mean, elite and democratic? You can see the different programs you're hearing from struggle with that question. Elite and democratic, what do they mean? Uh, in American higher education. I have a lot to sort of share or talk about that if that's a topic of people, but it's an un well, how it's currently configured or common sensibly thought about, in my view, both in establishment institutions like anchor institutions like a Hopkins or a Notre Dame or a Wash U where we've developed a program, and in often radical or liberal and progressive interventions aimed at democratizing access to the best that this country can do with its best students is problematic. So I feel both on the, there's a problem here with how we figure elite and democratic and their relationships, both among radicals and among the sort of establishment. And I think this work demands that we look at that directly. Happy to talk about more. The other is, of course, is this vocational and liberal arts thing. If you think the criminal justice paradigm and the humanities paradigm is problematic for thinking about higher education and people who are in prison who should have always been at great universities and, and can one day be, the great pressures on de, um, uh, how would you say dehumanizing when you're talking about the curriculum, right? Dehumanizing the curriculum. When you're faced with that, um, you know, the two great pressures are recidivism and vocational training. And those are class languages. Those are languages of class oppression, vocational education, and uh, recidivism reduction and rehabilitation. Those are all really, I think this takes me back to our introduction that we got from Nathan. These are, these are, these are structural discourses of, of inequality uh, that this work really, if to be done well, has to disrupt. Okay, so you have a sense of the scale of what we do at Bard, uh, the lift that the small college is taking on, the breadth of the academic uh, riches. Why did we start with German? Why is our first foreign language in German? Is that relevant to this pop population? Is it of interest to this population? Where our first BA seminar, we have an upper level sequence of mandatory cross-disciplinary seminars to get people to their senior project. It was on Du Bois. We had an anthropologist, an historian, and a chair of literature at Bard teaching it. And when the students found out that he had done all his Weber and Marx in German, they thought we were condescending to them by giving their theory and translation. And uh, we ended up with three different cycles from zero to 400 in German. Uh, same thing happened with Mandarin, because when the next cohorts of students came through and saw that the other guys had done Mandarin, had done German, they were like, we'll show them. <laughs> we'll do Mandarin. 
Uh, so Bard works with about uh, now around the country to help other colleges and universities do something similar uh, with um, Grinnell in Iowa, Wesleyan University, and early on with probably our most successful partner who's represented in this room by its director, Amy Rosa, at Goucher College here in Baltimore. Uh, I don't want to get in trouble with uh, Rosa, but, uh, you know, one thing this uh, faculty could certainly do is reach out to Amy Rosa and their, your colleagues who have really taken uh, risks. So we've worked with them, Washington University in St. Louis, our first R1 partner, Notre Dame and Holy Cross at Notre Dame in South Bend, uh, Dwight Hall at Yale University, uh, Princeton, uh, uh, at Princeton University, the STEM faculty, and so on. Uh, University of Puget Sound, uh, University of Vermont, we're in conversations, University of Iowa, about a dozen colleges and universities around the country, public and private, secular, Catholic, Lutheran, um, R1s, local liberal arts, uh, but there are certain principles that we share in common that we can speak more about together. So that's the, that's the sketch. I'll leave it there. I'd love to have uh, more of a conversation. I will say one thing. I think, to end, uh, I think that too often, uh, when we're thinking about uh, inclusiveness and radically inclusive structures, what we ask students to do is implicitly make a trade-off. And what we trade off for radically democratic inclusion is the high-end capacity of students, a sense that the sky is the limit, intellectually, creatively, professionally. And uh, that really is an unacceptable trade-off, but I think it's standard for how America addresses the question of elite versus inclusive, democratic uh, educational structures. So that's it. Lots to talk about. Thank you. I'm firing up the um, the screen so that folks can get on the Wi-Fi. Um, I know I know some people are trying to get on, um, and so and then you can um, you can use the hand, the hand mic. You can use the hand um, mic. Okay. Well. Okay. While Nathan is getting us yeah. uh, connected, um, I, let me just say that was a, um, a a terrific panel. I think we got we we got um, a set of um, a set of examples of what's happening here um, and also a set of sharp um, I think but hopefully productive uh, sort of disagreements in terms of kind of vision or at least uh, you know opening up a, a set of questions about what we think um, the vision of um, a, a, a prison education uh, is or should be or should not be um, there's a whole you know there's a there's a lot of questions and and that that uh, come out of this um, and I may uh, just open it up by say y y you know Raising the paradox, which I think was was um, implicit and, and explicit in several of, of, of these comments, which is um, the extent to which in in the um, university and, and and kind of political world that we live in, the, the ways in which um, the humanities and the social sciences uh, are uh, are or feel themselves under siege, um, the rise of you know of this kind of emphasis on on STEM at um, you know across the, the the system of higher education. And um, what we have here um, uh, coming in out of the prison um, education world, which is um, this really strong emphasis on liberal arts, um, almost the, 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 the very opposite of, um, of, of the kind of STEM. You know, we, we have recently where a governor, I forget if it's North Carolina or Florida, was saying we shouldn't even fund students who aren't, who aren't doing STEM education. And, and yet at the same time, we have these um, small, and, and it's, it doesn't seem um, accidental that it's emerged out of these small liberal arts college and is now sort of percolating um, into, into larger research institutions. But, um, but this real vision on, of, of liberal arts um, in what might, be the, what might seem to be the most unlikely of, of um, e educational settings. So um, we, you know, maybe we can start w with some of that, or, or we can just um, open it up to questions or comments from the from the audience. Uh, and I and I would like to recognize also uh, Amy Rosa. Who, yeah, let's recognize Amy Rosa, who who also is, has been very um, uh, and Jennifer Munt, who's who works in the in the uh, Goucher Prison Exchange Program, uh, Prison Education Program, um, keep doing that, and uh, and who who have done a lot of work here in, in Maryland. Okay, great. I'd like to just jump in. Uh, 
look, the more wealthy and more prestigious the institutions, the more risk averse they are. Okay, they dread the more the more capacity they have to take risks, the less they want to. I can tell you that from my last 17 years. This has been my career for the last 17 years. That's almost to a T. Is it surprising that it's not Hopkins, but it's Goucher doing this work here? No, not to me. Not to me. Uh, as my colleague in launching the Emerson in launching the Emerson College prison program in downtown Boston and a Concord Correctional Facility uh, this fall. Uh, Craig Wilder came and gave the opening talk, uh, and who from MIT, Chair of History Department at MIT. And Craig said, uh, you know, what we need from our, our academic institutions, he didn't even say we need risk taking, we need recklessness. We need, re well, those were Craig's words, except he is very calm and collective in how he shares them. Recklessness, that's what he wants. And our, ins our universities, and the more they are what I call anchor institutions, the lead employers, the institutions that will ride out any governor, any commissioner, any head of any prison. You have, you have bastions here of, of leverage and stability. You can outlast any regime and you can build uh, really impressive infrastructures um, for educational excellence and outlast those who are resistant to you. Um, that doesn't, is not the typical way that this work happens. So can, can I, I would just say that. Yeah, can please. I respond to, to yeah. that too? Because I, I think that's a really, that's a really excellent way of describing how I understand what we've been doing. You know, it, and, and obviously we're at, a, we're at a very much sort of more preliminary stage, but, but trying to figure out how to build an infrastructure that will last in the university you know, I think we, s I, I, I tell people this and, and they, you know, they, they, want, they want to talk about education on the inside. And of course, we should talk about education on the inside and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hugely important thing and it's a big part of what we're talking about today. But, but I end up finding myself talking a lot about the sort of, um, the, the sort of mundane details of how to navigate the kind of the university setting, especially the the sort of large risk averse real estate corporation that I um, that I teach at, um, and 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 it's it's a and it's a really interesting thing. And w one of the, the the sort of strange things that happened recently, and all of you have, have know about this, I'm sure, is that when the story broke about Michelle Jones, um, who was admitted as a PhD student in the program that I teach in, in American Studies. Um, so, so American Studies and the so Department of Social and Cultural Analysis are very close to the prison education program. And so um, Michelle was admitted through the PhD, into the PhD program. It doesn't have, doesn't have anything specifically to do with the prison education program, although it's also part of the kind of the kind of the network that's formed that sort of allowed that to happen. And when the NYU president saw that story in the New York Times, basically saying like making Harvard look really, really bad for you know basically rescinding their admission of Michelle Jones, suddenly we're getting calls from the you know what we call the twelfth floor at NYU about the prison education program. And the next thing you know, NYU pres the, the NYU president's coming to our graduation at the prison. He's never been to the prison, you know. And it's kind of like suddenly we've got, you know, we've got like you know the red carpet being rolled out. He he travels with Secret Service agents. I mean, there's all kinds of things going on, you know. So here we are, just kind of plowing our little furrow in this in this u big u research university, and we're a very small program. Um, and now we're we're sort of in a in a kind of a different relationship to it because there's a there's a sort of a sense that this might actually be something of value. I think it, this is a moment of peril for us too, of course, because having scrutiny from the 12th floor of Bobst is not necessarily always the thing that you, you want. I mean, they want, they want to pitch stories to the New York Times, they want to highlight our students, and you know, all of this can go very wrong. I mean, my, my inclination up to now has been to, like I said, avoid really talking much about this publicly and just kind of doing, doing the work, um, because doing the work is extremely hard in the university, not to mention navigating the correctional landscape. And, but, but I do think that, that, Dan, that Daniel's right and what Bard is doing around the country is really important that, that, that universities, if universities are lost right now, 
in terms of their sense of what their mission is, you know, consumed with fights about Title IX and no platforming and, um, you know, conservative attacks. Um, he, here's an example, not the only example, but an example where the university can recover its sort of sense, you know, the sort of the Deweyan sense of kind of, um, you know, kind of public service, essentially. I mean, NYU was founded as a private university in the public interest, but s a few years ago, the public interest part just kind of dropped off the, the masthead, and I think we're one of the few experiments inside the university um, that's really reestablishing that sense of what the university can be. And, and it's not exactly for liberation in the sense that Garrett's talking about. I mean, I, I think about this all the time, you know, what is the political, what is the political end? You know, what is the political aim? Are we doing political education? A lot of our students are becoming organizers. You know, we've 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 linked up with organizations like Just Leadership USA and other organizations that are that are actually thinking about training formerly incarcerated professionals to have a seat at the table in terms of advocacy and be part of the conversation. I think that's extremely important. Um, uh, we are also part of the correctional landscape. You know, and it's irreducible. So, I mean, I think we should talk more about that, that, that challenge and, and, and the kinds of um, kind of problems it potentially raises. Does anyone in the audience want to comment, question? Yeah. I'm a PhD member of the Press Center at the Harvard School of Politics, and I look around this room, and obviously there are a whole lot of opinions. Mm -hmm. You're speaking about issues that we, we academically are with hands on the skin. Right. So May I respond, please? Yeah. Um, so I'll speak from a sort of, um, uh, as a sort of the academic director of the prison initiative really originally and now as an organizer. Uh, you know, our major goal, the charge we have from the university is to, uh, n that the, is that the worst thing a teacher can ever do, the cardinal sin for a teacher, is to underestimate their students. Uh, and I fear that that happens often in this work. So the number one thing that we are charged with doing is replicating the faculty of Bard College or Wash U or at NYU uh, to work with students who are unconventional uh, at the highest level. And that means replicating the faculty. Uh, and that is, you know, we work at hierarchical organizations. All of these, um, all of our institutions are hierarchical. And American higher education is not just hierarchical, it's a pyramid. It's a pyramid. Part of the dynamics of our organizing has to do with how we relate to that pyramid. So for us at BARD, I can say it is an extremely long-term relationship with students who become uh, peers and eventually become uh, our superiors, whether it's as you know, the number of students we have who are graduates who have far gone beyond my educational attainment and are now out, however, pursuing their own c careers as sociologists, as epidemiologists, as social workers, uh, is how we seek that. And they, it is to them at places like Glenn Martin and leading the just new justice leadership, they become our colleagues. You know, Second Chance Pell is really with us today because of formerly incarcerated leadership in organizing. Uh, not so much in academic design, which is what the faculty of Senate at NYU or Bard does, but in taking their extraordinary achievements academically and professionalizing them and going out into the world and creating their new careers. So I see that as really uh, the way the college relates to the long-term success and ambitions of its alumni, the same way it does with all alumni. That's how I see it. I'll try to be um, brief too, and maybe, maybe yeah. Garrett wants to say something. Um, I think what you're saying is ex extremely important. I, I think maybe, it, maybe I'll articulate a little bit of a middle ground. I mean, I really agree with Daniel about um, 
Like we take the standard of education very, very seriously. And I think that's, um, it's very, very important to us that we're training our students to be able to participate in the conversation in whatever field they're going to end up going into. And, and as I said, we are working with students who are mostly slated to be released. So that creates a certain character to our work. Um, but the goal is to bring students into the conversation at each, at each, at each setting, right? So we have a student council at the prison, as I said, which is heavy, now heavily involved in a kind of ongoing uh, pro process, both inside the prison in terms of challenges of the program in the prison. As you know, you know there there are basically challenges like are guys getting to class on time? What kinds of COs are like messing with our program? You know what what kinds of what kinds of problems are coming up in terms of the distribution of materials? So they're getting involved in all kinds of levels of, of basically helping to run the program in the prison and recruit new students. So that's one layer. Then there's a student council on the outside. So we have a student advisory board that works with our program on the outside. So including students that are employed by our program as interns. And since we now have students who have been admitted to NYU, they're actually in NYU as, as, as students. So, so again, it's a kind of student-centered governance, if you will, because all colleges have student government, so we want to have student government. That seems to me to be a completely legitimate way of thinking about a role for students in relationship to a program. And then, then third, we have an advisory board. And on our advisory board, we have people like Glenn Martin and people who have been formerly incarcerated who are, who are advising our program and kind of thinking about our program's mission and values and making sure that it's aligned with a kind of vision of what it means to think about this work as being centered on having formerly incarcerated people have a place at the table. Um, now, that extends then to things like the admission of Michelle Jones into our PhD program, the prospect of hiring formerly incarcerated faculty. So in the School of Social Work, Kirk James just started, who's a, a formerly incarcerated um, pers uh, a PhD in social work who now runs all the programs in the School of Social Work that are about justice-involved communities. So we're building, again, a wider network. And we do have as one of our values the, 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 the idea that formerly incarcerated people need to be in the conversation wherever we can. we can we can make that happen, you know? So I think you're absolutely right. Um, and it's a process, you know, a, a kind of as Daniel said, it's something that, that sort of evolves out of doing the work, but I, but I do see it as, a, as, as something that needs to be a core commitment of this work. And in that sense, I, I completely agree with you. Could I respond really briefly? Um, so I see part of your question in terms of outside my scope, which is about organizing this conference. And that's the part I'm gonna, <laughs> uh, throw over to Nathan. I'm sure he'll be thankful for that. Um, but just in, in terms of talking about my program, because it's kind of an outlier here at the table, um, for me, that's why I think the framing is like political organizing and why I ended with talking about um, formerly incarcerated people as political agents. And to me, I just see my role as, as resource allocation um, and redistribution within the university is just trying to be a person within the university who can take those funds or the, the parts that Nikhil talks about as sort of underutilized or be creative about it and, and reallocate those things. Um, I don't see myself as going around speaking on behalf of incarcerated, form, formerly incarcerated people in any way. Um, we're planning a conference at Harvard and I'm trying very hard to get funding to bring the guys who have graduated from liberation literacy and are you know, on the outs now to come out and talk about the program because that's what I want. Um, so ultimately, if you're asking the question of where at the table I want people, I want people here where I'm sitting because I don't want to be sitting here talking about this. Um, but I'm speaking as myself, as a person who you know co-founded this organization. I'm a say I'm a edu I'm not an educated individual. I didn't have the luxury or, or the ability to attend the college because college ain't for everybody. But I'm still a population of the of the incarcerated. But I'm smart enough to deal with it because I know politics. You see what I'm saying? Exactly. I don't have a degree. Mm -hmm. We, I'm from Illinois. They killed the Pell Grant. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So I was stuck in the middle. I know what you're talking about, educating inside and the trials and tribulations you got to go to through to do it. You, they don't want it. They want an uneducated population. But you can learn, you know what I'm saying? We still need to 
a round table outside of your comfort zone. One one of the things that um one one of the things that really uh, that I learned from that really inspired me kind of in my in gr kind of growing up and learning was the whole tradition of of non-degree adult education that used to be workers education. There were there were so many spaces of education, political education in this society that used to exist outside the university. Um, you know, the, the person I did a lot of work with, Jack O'Dell, you know, uh, who was extremely important in the history of the civil rights movement, you know, never, never finished college. You know, he got his education in the National Maritime Union on ships, reading, reading books and having reading groups and discussions. So I, this is what I love about what, what Garrett's doing, because I think that, that, that we do try to incorporate that vision to the extent to which we can into what we do, which is to say, when we say one of our value, one of the values of our program is the continuing education of people coming out of prison, it's not just about people who enroll in college. It's not just about people who, you know, it's about actually creating spaces for, so we have an active writing group that's gone on that's self-organized among, among our guys who, you know, they come to the space, they, they meet, they, they're, they're, they're sharing writing, they're sharing reading, and it's not about being in college, it's about using the space of the college to, to reinvigorate this idea that, that learning is a lifelong goal, that education is something that everyone should have access to throughout their lives, um, and that universities have certain spaces that can, that can, that can be used for that purpose. You know, it's, again, it's very small scale, but I do think it's an idea worth, you know, worth, um, worth thinking about. And if you can identify yourself, please, when you do speak. Hello, my name is um, Melanie McPherson. I grew up in what would now be known as the ghetto. We have musicians, artists, painters, and poets. And I believe I got a real good education. One more. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Khalil Bay, and uh, I was in the Corsorcha Inn up at uh, Attica State Prison. We had a consortium, it was under Damien College, uh, Niagara University, and SUNY Brockport. And of course, uh, getting an education in prison was an obstacle in itself as a prisoner and uh, pro you know, proclaimed to be a violent offender. I found myself being a target by the uh, correctional officers because they didn't want to see me get a degree and they had the argument where they, you know, others would have to pay, they and their families would have to pay for a college education where I was getting it free, you know, but I, I looked at it entirely different. Then I had the big question mark because, you know, like uh, my background was power to the people. And at one time it was against the law to teach a black man how to read or write, right? Now we're going to college and what have you, and I'm saying, what the hell am I learning in here, right? Am I learning to stand on my head like the mortarboard reflects, you know, or am I, you know, my understanding, is it gonna take me through life to a place where, you know, I can be successful and, you know, uplifting my people? You follow what I'm saying? Because I know that's what it is. Uh, it, am I getting a political education here? Yes, I am, right? Because I realize that, you know, that education wasn't something that I was supposed to get because then the Pell Grant stopped, you know, it cut it off and what have you. And I can't even get credits for that, in, you know, uh, <laughs> throughout the system and stuff, yeah, that I got. Uh, like, like you say, I think we should think about these as, these are uh, parallel and deeply interpenetrated struggles. Mm -hmm. The American Academy has, it, it, look at what this place looked like in 1930. Okay, look at what it looked like in 1964. Look what it looks like today. Meaning, I'm not, I'm not an academic, I'm not a professor, but my colleagues in the academy have been, you know, really transformed the nature of what political education looks like. What does a history department here look like? What are disciplines? So I would love it if at some point some of my colleagues in the academy could speak to how, you know, they feel they, where do they feel the, um, the accomplishments have come in, driven by the social movements and the radical political movements all over, right? I think there's a sort of, right, there's a, um, there's a divide between the academy, because it's politically and economically so 
screwed up right now, and the intellectual productivity of it and creative productivity of it that's so deeply changed in political sense of the terms. I'd love it if we could sort of try to somehow reach out to that, because what you're talking about, the mortarboard and standing on your head, um, our colleagues inside the academy, I think, have stood the academy on its head. Ironically, right, there's a dialectic here, if you will, there's a tension between the increasingly risk-averse, rich, prestige hoarding, uh, gentrifying, eminent domaining university, and the flourishing of intellectual and political and creative transformation on the campus in, in its intellectual life that was driven by the generations that certainly came before me uh, in radical politics. And that's fascinating right now. And I somehow this work that we're talking about today and maybe the whole conference is somehow tied up in, that, in those rip currents that we're in of a really transformed faculties, really transformed research agendas and, and intellectual creativity, the, the, what radicals and, and political people have done before us, and the increasing ossification and conservatism of you know the, inst in the institutional landscape of, of universities. That's something fascinating here. That's I think we're very. Your 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 I think your your mortarboard comment I think draws our attention uh, to that. So I think it's. I mean I think it's useful to to think about the the, the co complexity of these institutions, which are you know as you say full of tensions and dialectics and and. One other response, I mean, I don't think I'm saying, one other comment based on, on what you just said, I mean, I don't think I'm saying anything that anyone in the room doesn't know, but it's worth just kind of getting on the table here is the, the, the larger kind of structural um, situation uh, within prisons, but, but uh, in terms of where prisons are located, um, where, you know, these, these end up being the main um, drivers of local economies and one of the very few places where people can get job, people without college education can get jobs with that pay decently without um, uh, you know with good benefits and um, and that is one of the real uh, you know terrible paradoxes of the, of the situation which you know gets at the tensions that you were talking about before oh how are we on time is that, is that pretty much it well you're the could, boss here could so I just make one um, <laughs> one comment yeah please kind of it's, yes, talking to the mic so here. I mean just in terms of like thinking through what my role is in, in a group like liberation literacy and kind of just as an interlocutor um, and an advocate in some ways, D DOC structures hierarchies in a way that sort of reinscribe these relationships. So like the organization now that I'm gone, we essentially wanted it to just run with me gone. Like it's co-facilitated, you know, folks inside choose the books and people outside just figure out ways to get them inside. And for DOC, of course, a, a group of incarcerated people meeting without me there, they see that as insurrection. With me there, they see that as prisoner education and rehabilitation. Now, I can tell you those conversations look pretty much the same. We're talking about prison abolition, we're reading George Jackson. I, I'm not saying I'm absent in some way from the classroom, but I don't see myself as doing anything different other than being a resource and a facilitator. Um, but I think we need to be cognizant and, and always just thinking about the ways that DOC and the university kind of structure these hierarchies and ask that we play these roles. And, and constantly just try to subvert them and figure out ways to, to essentially just, you know. I mean, no one inside could have said, we want this Freedom Library, we want books on, on the Attica Rebellion, we want book, you know, books about queer identity. Um, but if I send those from publishers, they allow them in. And, and that's just understanding the fucked up way that these institutions run and just trying to leverage that positionality to get those books inside and let people do their do their organizing and their education. Yeah, I don't want us to. Well, no, please. The next, uh, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna thank our panelists and, and keep the conversation going. Thank you very much. As, as we transition, I want to make folks aware of a couple of things we have um, downstairs. We have a great report from the ABLE Foundation about prison education um, and the reintegration of folks into the workforce that we have extra copies of for folks who are interested. There's also a really wonderful calendar um, that uh, Josh Davidson was happy enough to provide us with um, from Certain Days, Freedom for Political Prisoners. Um, it's a, an organization and a movement basically between Montreal, Toronto, and New York. Um, the calendar includes bibliography, writings, original pieces of artwork, um, historical narrative by way of the calendar itself. It's actually a pretty incredible document. We have copies of that downstairs as well, as well as Josh being able to uh, fundraise for the movement by way of additional copies if you want to purchase them for sale. So we're going to transition to the second uh, panel for the day, um, and we'll do so with haste. So thank you.